Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Oh, thank you very much, Ian, for such a warm welcome and such an extensive biography. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I, I hear that this is a large audience for the RCP Edinburgh, um, and I hope if it's your first time here, you're enjoying your visit, and that if you haven't already, you'll look at their fabulous current exhibition, Searching for the Elixir of Life, which examines the history of alchemy from their fabulous collections. And while um, they might not have some of the books that we have at the Royal College of Physicians in London, we don't have a Ripley scroll. And <laughs> they do here, and I'm very jealous about that. So I've been invited here to speak about John Dee, one of the most intriguing and enigmatic figures in Tudor, England and Wales. John Dee is almost impossible to describe succinctly. We want to be able to pin him down as either a genius or a madman, as a scientist or as a magician. But in this paper, I'm going to argue that it's a mistake to view his multifariousness as a problem to be solved or his, an, his identity as an enigma to be baffled about. In fact, Dee's diverseness is the very core of his life's work and his life's ambitions. And we have to take him as a whole in order to understand each of his individual varied parts. So first, let me introduce you properly to Dr. John Dee, the Magus of Mortlake. He had a long and full life, um, so here's the best outline biography that I can manage. He was born on the 13th of July, 1527, in the city of London. His father, Roland, was a member of the Mercer's Company there, so he was a merchant, and his mother, Joan, owned property of her own in Mortlake, to the west of London. Dee was educated at Chelmsford Grammar School and then at St John's College, Cambridge. Um, so, in some small way, I'm an ex a successor to Dee uh, because I was cataloguing Hoyle's paper at St papers at St John's. Um, so, there is St John's in Elizabethan Cambridge. Um, while he was there, he would have studied the then typical syllabus of grammar, logic, and rhetoric based on the Greek and Latin classics. He later claimed that while he was a student in Cambridge, he studied 18 hours a day, um, leaving himself four hours for sleeping and a couple for chapel and food, I think. Um, on the back of all this industrious labour, he was appointed as one of the founding fellows of the neighbouring Trinity College in 1546, and there he taught Greek for a short time before apparently leaving to seek uh, more interesting and possibly more profitable employment elsewhere. Towards the end of the 1540s, he travelled on several occasions to the Low Countries, visiting cities including Antwerp and Louvain, um, and studying at some of the universities there. Um, and he, this marked a move in his interests from the, the classical subjects he'd been studying at university in England to mathematics and the mathematical sciences, which were very heavily studied and um, very well studied in the Low Countries at that time by people including this man, Gerard Mercator, um, famous to us today as the inventor of the Mercator projection for maps, very commonly used, although it doesn't represent different land mass sizes at all accurately. Um, Around this time, after his um, student days and in his early career, when I guess we'd now call him a new career, uh, new professional, um, he found favour with important aristocrats, including Sir William Cecil and the Duke of Northumberland, who were very high up in the English court at the time, and he worked for various noble families as an advisor. King Edward VI, the only legitimate son of Henry VIII and a Protestant reformer, granted Dee an annual pension, and Dee also worked at that time as a maths tutor, so he was doing pretty well. Um, throughout the 1550s and 1560s, we know that Dee travelled wi widely in Europe, meeting many of the leading lights of his time and collecting books and manuscripts from across the continent. His interests were wide, including mathematics, astronomy, astrology, alchemy, history, travel, geography, and many other subjects, and he built up a substantial library collection of his own, which we will be returning to in a little while. Having done well under Edward VI, Dee had a somewhat mixed experience under the following monarch, the Catholic Queen Mary I. Um, however, he managed to survive that period, and his connections during Edward's reign put him in a good position when Mary died in 1558, at the crown pass to her Protestant half-sister, Elizabeth I. At the request of Robert Dudley, who later became Earl of Leicester, Dee used astrology to calculate the most auspicious date for Elizabeth's coronation. 
Um, he chose the 15th of January, right at the start of 1559, um, which unsurprisingly turned out to be cold and unpleasant and probably didn't look very auspicious to the people who were there at the time. He's often described as a courtier to Elizabeth or with official sounding titles like the Queen's Conjurer or the Queen's Philosopher. He did provide advice, both solicited and unsolicited, to the Queen, but he wasn't particularly senior in her court and the court wasn't in any case organised such that most individuals had official titles granted by the Queen. Um, so although Dee was present in Elizabeth's circle, I like not to think of him as having an official role in it. Dee was always very keen to try and secure himself an official job and an official position with a regular income, and he was never very successful after his early pension from Edward in achieving that again. He also wasn't very good at seeing things through to completion, um, but he did manage to publish some books, as well as writing many more um, tracts and treatises that stayed in manuscript. Um, and some of his notable books, although there are others, um, are his Propaedemata Aphoristica of 1558, which expounded on his theory of the astrological uh, action of celestial bodies on the Earth, the way the rays from the sun and the stars and the planets are hitting us on Earth and the effects they're having. Um, it's not much of a page turner, I will be honest. And as you can see from this, this grab of some thumbnails, it's not very full of pictures. It's quite a tough and chewy read. Um, equally tough and chewy, but a bit more illustrated, is his Monas Hieroglyphica of 1564 which is an astrological, alchemical, and numerological explanation of the magical symbol that the book is named for, the hieroglyphic monad, um, which appears on the title page and um, which com combines various elements of astrological and alchemical um, imagery and symbolism into one figure that Dee believed contained all of human knowledge and alchemical knowledge somehow bound up in it. I will confess to not understanding this fully, so if your difficult questions for later are about the monas, um, maybe you could think of something different by the time we get to the end of the talk. Um, those who have, have seen the exhibition here will note the importance of the sun and the moon in um, astrology. And in those are two of the, the primary symbols here in the... Oh, that's exciting. Have you all got that? There we go. Oh. Um, you can see here at the top, there's a, a crescent moon and beneath it, the symbol for the sun. Um, which are two of the very important parts of alchemy and indeed astrology and which feature prominently in the monas, that much I can tell you. Um, another work that Dee was involved in was the um, very important first English translation of the mathematical works of Euclid, um, the expert in geometry. And Dee didn't complete the translation himself, but he did supply an extensive introduction to this book, which was published in 1570. And here you can see the summary of his introduction, which is an enormous scheme or plan for the mathematical sciences in all their variety and how they're all connected to each other. So it includes what we would today think of as pure maths, things like arithmetic and geometry, and then all sorts of applications of maths, whether that's cartography or astrology or um, various kinds of mechanics or even thaumaturgic, which Dee said is that art mathematical which giveth certain order to make strange works of men greatly to be wondered at. And when you read into it in more detail, it turns out that what he's talking about is mechanical magic and trickery, ways of making things appear to seem to move of their own accord in various exciting ways. Um, and it's also one of the best books um, of, of Elizabethan England, I think, because it has these fabulous diagrams in it to illustrate three-dimensional geometry. Um, they don't move of their own accord. <laughs> um, but they do look splendid once you've unfolded them all. Um, another important book, both for the country and for Dee, was his general and rare memorials pertaining to the perfect art of navigation. Now, it says it's about navigation, but really it's about empire building. And this is the first book in the English language to use the phrase British Empire. And it was a treatise of advice to Elizabeth saying that she had rights to lands beyond England. Um, notably, Scotland doesn't really feature, actually, in this, but um, various other lands further abroad, so um, places in North America particularly, that Dee believed the Queen could and should expand into, um, and he had done various researches to try and establish her rights to them. So in 1665, Dee moved into his mother's old house at Mortlake, which is six or seven miles up the River Thames from the centre of... London, as it then was, and was near to the palace um, at Richmond, where Elizabeth spent a lot of her time. Um, so that here 
uh, that there is the City of London and Westminster, so that's really the heart of things. Um, over here is Mortlake, and then that there is Richmond, so they're pretty close to each other. Um, today, of course, this is all part of Greater London, and you can travel seamlessly through it without seeing anything green the whole way along. <laughs> Um, Dee built up his house not only as a place to live, but also as a centre for work. His library was substantial in size and heavily used not just by Dee himself, but by his students, friends, associates, and scholars from around the country and from elsewhere in Europe. Dee cultivated his home really as a sort of research centre. Um, visitors to his library that he built up there um, included explorers and people funding them and various other um, scholars and practical people of the time. And this is a catalogue, this is just two pages of Dee's library catalogue. Um, but you can see, this is his own handwriting and you can see how he was quite meticulous in recording um, the books he had. Um, as well as his library, the book was furnished, uh, as well as the library, the house was furnished with laboratories, three in total, um, in which he undertook alchemical experiments. Um, in 1571, he even travelled over to Lorraine in France, on the French-German border, um, to pu purchase glassware to use in the labs, and he wanted to go and buy it himself and oversee its shipping home. Um, and he had very many alchemical books, um, including Paracelsus, Geber, Delaporta, uh, Bacon and Ripley, all characters you can meet in the exhibition, um, and many others. And he did have in his collection a Ripley scroll. Not that I'm keeping track of this. Um, <laughs> Um, and this is an illustration that Dee drew himself of some fairly simple and straightforward alchemical uh, equipment. So towards the end of the 1570s, Dee began to develop the interest for which he is most famous and which has really come to define his reputation, an interest in communicating with spirits through a crystal ball. Like that. By the early 1580s, Dee was employing men as scryers, people who saw and heard visions in crystals and communicated them to Dee. Dee's, or rather his scryer's angelic visions and the spirit actions in which they took place, continued over several years, and his longest serving scryer was a man called Edward Kelly. Dee recorded the conversations that Kelly reported to be having with a range of archangels, angels, and other spiritual beings in extensive diaries. The scrying sessions, which you might think of as being like seances, although that's a completely anachronistic term, were heavily ritualised, taking place in a darkened room, starting with prayers and continuing with the participants arranged around a special holy table adorned with talismanic objects in addition to the small round crystal that was central to the practice. Through Kelly, Dee asked the angels about all sorts of different things, including religion, predictions for the future and matters relating to his own personal life. Kelly related extraordinary dreamlike visions, which in the descriptions read very similar to the sort of images you see in alchemical books, some, in things like the Ripley Scroll, bizarre animals, bizarre structures, weird things happening to them. Um, and Dee interpreted these as prophecies. In the conversations, the revelation of a secret ancient language called Enochian became an overriding preconception. Dee believed that this language was the original language of humans on Earth, and that after the fall of mankind, our own language on Earth and our understanding of it and of the world had been slowly and steadily corrupted over time. Dee believed that by rediscovering this language, a perfect knowledge of and control over the material world could be gained. Um, this is just one page from the published, first published version of Dee's Spiritual di Diaries, and on this page um, you can see Edward Kelly here, E.K., um, and then the angel Gabriel is talking to Kelly, and down here at the bottom is Nal, who is Nal Vaj, um, a lesser spiritual being, a sort of um, angelic spirit, who was also um, very active in the conversations. In 1583, Dee's spiritual activity came to the attention of a visiting Polish aristocrat in London, a man called Count, oh, Count Albrecht Waski. Waski clearly flattered Dee because Dee uncharacteristically took Waski into his confidence about the scrying and even allowed him to witness one of the sessions. Waski invited Dee and Kelly and their wives, Jane and Joanna, and Dee's children to come to his estate in Poland. The Count promised a handsome income and resources so that Dee and Kelly could carry on with their scrying and devote themselves to alchemical research. To cut a long story short, Waski did not come up with the goods, and Dee and Kelly were left fending for themselves in Central Europe. They, 
and their families and 800 of Dee's most treasured books moved from city to city, passing through Krakow in Poland and on into Prague, where they spent some considerable time. Dee tried to charm the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II with his Monas Hieroglyphica while he was there, um, but that wasn't very successful. And eventually Dee and Kelly fell out after the angels instructed them to share everything in their lives, including their wives. <laughs> And Dee, at this point, Dee and his family left Kelly behind. Um, and Kelly had a surprisingly successful ongoing alchemical career whilst the Dees made their way back to London. They made it home in late 1589 to find that their house at Mortlake had been ransacked and Dee's library had been broken up and vandalised. The house and the library within it had been left in the safekeeping of Jane's brother, Nicholas Frommond, who may have been complicit, in fact, in allowing the thieves' entry. For many, a, uh, many years, the account was that a local mob, enraged by Dee's mystical activities, had pillaged the house. The reality is that the books were probably actually stolen by people who knew what they were after, were taking the opportunity that Dee had left by being away from the house for so long. Um, in, and the, the thieves included people that Dee had definitely known in the past. He was able, however, to recover some of these books and objects. So if we turn back to the catalogue, um, he's marked up the entries with a code so you can see what he took and what he lost. Um, the things with a T he took with him to Europe. The things with the FR he got back from Nicholas Frommond. Some of them have other people's names next to them. Um, this is a certain John Davis that stole some of the things. Um, but then there are many that have no marking and those are the books, those are the books that Dee was never able to recover. Um, it was devastating for Dee to lose this library. Um, and it was a really defining feature of his life, but also a defining feature of our understanding of him today, because many of the stolen books, um, or many of the books that are, most of the books that are now in the D collection at the RCP London, and we have over 150 of them, which is the largest surviving collection, probably all came via the same thief. I am obliged to say that no RCP fellows are implicated directly in the thefts. Um, but through a chain of association, they finally found their way to us. Dee really spent the rest of his life trying to rebuild after this. He did finally get a proper job towards the end of his life, although, again, it wasn't very happy for him. He was made dean of the um, collegiate church, which is now the cathedral, sorry, the warden, not a dean, they call it there, um, the warden of the collegiate church in Manchester. Um, it was a hotbed of Protestant reform. And Dee, though his religious convictions were quite malleable, never easy to pin down into boxes, really didn't fit in there. Um, in fact, there's a, a local myth that this mark on a desk that's now in Cheetham's library, um, which is in the old buildings of the Collegiate Church, um, has a burn mark on it, which was left by the hoof print of the devil that Dee had summoned one day. <laughs> it's a good story. Um, not only did Dee not get on with his colleagues in Manchester, there was an outbreak of plague in 1605, and as far as we can tell from the records, Dee's wife Jane died in that outbreak, as did most of their surviving children. Jane bore Dee eight children, and only two of them survived past that point. So sometime after this, Dee returned to London. Um, and in the early years of the 1700s, James VI and First of England was now on the throne. Um, and he was very anti-witchcraft, and I think Dee felt quite concerned that he might fall prey to victimisation from the king. He died at the end of March 1609, having left his Mortlake house and having sold some of his remaining books to make ends meet um, in the house of a friend of his in Bishopsgate in London. Um, so that's a brief overview of Dee. Um, let us now dig a little deeper. I've already mentioned his library as a site of scholarship, where students, intellectuals and practical people of the day gathered to consult books and to discuss theories and ideas. Um, some of this activity, albeit only from Dee's personal perspective, is actually um, preserved inside the books in a rich network of annotations left behind in their margins. Um, so what I'm going to do now is take us through some of the annotations that Dee left to give you a bit more of an insight into some of the things he was interested in. Um, many people caution that we should be careful about how much we read into marginalia, but in Dee's case, I feel it's hard not to see his library and his book use as expressions of his life story, his interests, and his personality. 
Um, the illustrations I'm going to use mostly come from books in the RCP collections, um, and they are by no means a representative sample of Dee's life and work, but they are the books I know best. His total library may have numbered as many as 3,000 printed books and 1,000 manuscripts, um, and as I said, at the RCP we have about 150, which don't include any of the manuscripts, um, nor do they include the objects, scientific objects he owned, um, nor do they include the books he took with him to Europe, um, but they are the ones I have to hand to talk about. Um, many of them have been recently uh, digitised as part of the Archaeology of Reading project, um, which is a major project to develop ways of transcribing and translating marginalia in books to make them searchable and analysable in new ways. Um, so if you want to immerse yourselves in some more Deana after tonight, um, you go to archaeologyofreading.org. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you think of that in your head as archaeology of reading or archaeology of reading, <laughs> which is a slightly unfortunate um, joint use of the word. So let's look at some examples. Um, this is a page from the end of a manual on astrology, and it's actually the end of the, the corrections in the errata list. It was written by the Italian astrologer and physician Girolamo Cardano, um, published in 1547. It's a splendid book all round. It's, it's really a lovely, lovely volume. And it contains a lot of horoscope charts of famous people from the past, analysing their characters um, based on their horoscopes. Um, and there's lots of notes left by Dee in this book um, from a period in his life when he was starting to um, learn to do astrology practically himself. Um, but the illustration I've chosen is here from the end of the book, uh, where we get some concrete information about Dee's early days. Uh, the inscription's a bit faded, and it's in Latin, and it's in Dee's rather scratchy handwriting. Um, but here it is, and what it says is, Veni in servitio comitis W. Pembroke, 1552, fine februari DA 28. You'll have to forgive me that I'm very bad at Latin numbers. Um, and what that means is, I came into the service of the Earl of Pembroke, William of Pembroke, in 1552, at the end of February, on the 28th day. And this might seem like a strange and arbitrary place to start recording your CV. <laughs> but it does make sense in context. William Herbert, first Earl of Pembroke, um, was a soldier and magnet, and Dee seems to have been employed by him as some kind of advisor, an astrological advisor, someone who would give um, information about the most auspicious day to hold an event or a wedding or to plant the crops, maybe, or someone who would make predictions about the children's health or marriage prospects or you know, anything else that people wanted to know about. Um, elsewhere in this same book, Dee records the birth date of Herbert's second wife, Anne Compton, née Talbot, and at least one of her children. The sort of information that would have been vital for him when casting horoscopes for these people, because you need to know time and place of birth. Um, at this point in his career, when Dee was just setting out, it makes sense that he'd have needed to refer to his textbooks frequently. Um, so it seems like an ideal place for him to note down this practical information. Dee's life isn't really from the 1550s, very well documented. We don't have any of his own diaries from that time. So little snippets like this dotted about the place can be really useful in piecing together what he was doing when. And sometimes they enable us to piece together very, very precisely what he was up to. Um, so these are two pages from a book that predicts solar and lunar eclipses. Um, these are both lunar eclipses. And on the right-hand picture, you can see the moon being eclipsed. Um, the left-hand page predicts a, predicts a lunar eclipse in November 1556, um, and D has noted, Hic nobis Londini in capit post horam 12 minutum 20, meaning this, i.e. the eclipse, began by us in London at 20 minutes after 12. And the various other notes on that page are him noting down more details where in the sky it was, how long it lasted, that sort of thing. Um, and on the other page is something similar. Um, this is about a lunar eclipse that was predicted for October 1566, so 10 years later. And the note in the margin on this case has been very badly cropped. A later bookbinder has trimmed the pages so they're all smooth and beautiful. Um, but it does mean we've lost some of Dee's notes. However, there's enough there that we can piece together what he's saying. And um, we've got finem ego obs mort lucky something, um, which is handily, just enough words for us to piece together the end I observed at Mortlake. So I think we can say he was in Mortlake at this time in his new house, watching this eclipse as well. He was a keen watcher of the heavens, um, and he records in some of his later diaries missing various solar eclipses because it was cloudy. Um, and I sympathise with him. I have missed solar eclipses because it was cloudy. 
Um, these are some notes from his student days when he was in Louvain in August 1548. And um, on the right-hand page is a list of every day in August. And Dee is using a code in this to record what the weather was doing on those days. The left-hand page has the key to the code in some really terrible handwriting. Um, but once you spend a little time staring at it, you can piece together for it that, for example, on the 3rd of August, the weather was clear and hot with a light wind from the southwest. Um, it says three for the third, a sort of triangular symbol meaning that it was clear, calida, the letter Latin for hot, um, and then 11 is the position around the compass, and then the bars for a light wind. What's interesting about these notes is that they come from the end of a short compendium of different works on astronomy, astronomical instruments, and astrology. So it's tempting to think that Dee is trying to relate the weather, the, the climate close to Earth, to what's going on in the heavens, and that he's trying to make connections between meteorology and astrology, and to try and piece together the systems that are working and underlying what's going on. Um, Interests and personality are usually less easy to pin down than biographical facts, uh, but they are also approachable, I think, through Dee's marginalia, and this is one of my favourite examples for doing this. This is a page from an account of the Trojan Wars, um, which was ascribed to the mythical author Dares Frigius. And it's interesting to a modern reader because it doesn't include what probably for most of us is the most famous part of the Trojan Wars, namely the Trojan Horse. And this was noticed by Dee as well. So here at the bottom of the page, he writes, Nihil hic de equo Trojano, which for those, many of you have got it already, but some of you won't. That means nothing here about the Trojan horse. Oh dear. However, this account of the Trojan Wars is paired with another account from a mythical author, um, in this time, in, in this instance, Dictus Cretensis. Um, and there's a different note. Equus Trojanus, <laughs> Trojan horse. Now, it's fair to say that Dee was quite a detail-oriented man, but it may just be that he was aware of the slightly comic potential of searching through this book looking for the horse. And we move from horses to dragons. This lovely little drawing is actually a really recent discovery. Um, the book in question, which is an account of the history of the Roman emperors, um, from 1533 from the Froben Press, um, has recently been away for conservation work because it was in a terrible state. And the conservators have been going through cleaning it up and found this dragon on this page. I mean, actually tweeted at me to say they'd found it because it's, it's 21st century and that's how these things happen now. Um, and I thought, oh, how exciting, dragons. But are there dragons in the history of the Roman emperors? This seems unlikely. And um, what this actually is, and we can tell this from the text next to it that Dee's underlined, is an account um, of the emperor, the 4th century AD emperor, Julianus Caesar, going into battle with his ensign, with his, you know, his standard, to rally the troops round. And the standard is the purple ensign of a dragon, fitted to the top of a very long lance and spreading out like the discarded skin of a serpent. So that's a lovely description. And so here is that lance with that, that dragon on the top. And Dee's made a little drawing of it so he can find this passage again when he's thinking, where was it I read about that dragon on a stick? Um, but it is quite a cheerful little dragon. So although I think of Dee as a, a very serious man, you know, this, this gives me a slightly different perspective on him. Um, he wasn't just into animals in his books. His interests really did range astonishingly widely. And he's always on the lookout for interesting snippets whenever he's reading. Um, so this is a classical text, one of the texts he studied and probably taught as well at Cambridge. Um, it's a, from the complete works of Cicero, and this section is actually on the nature of the gods. And here in this annotation in the margin, which for change is in English, um, Dee says, printing then was in Cicero's time. By like mark, this place and the boxes wherein the leaden or other letters stand, which again doesn't make a lot of sense, when you first read it, but when you look at the text, there's a description there of, um, or an analogy that Cicero uses to try and tell the reader that it's impossible that the earth could have been created just by chance. There must be a, a driving force behind it. Because, Cicero says, imagine if you had a load of little letters made out of metal and you just threw them on the ground. It would be impossible for them to suddenly spell out the works of some great author. And that's like creation. It couldn't just have happened by chance. But Dee has latched onto the little metal letters and had decided that printing, 
printing with a movable type in a mechanised press had already been invented in the time of the Roman authors. And that's what this note is saying. Printing had been invented by Cicero's time. So technological history, dragon ensigns, eclipses, all sorts of things were catching Dee's attention. Um, and this next illustration, or this next annotation I like because it's the sort of thing I would do. Um, this is a history of Normandy by Thomas Walsingham, and uh, Dee is clearly reading it like most of us when reading a historical book or Shakespeare's plays or a big Russian novel. And he reaches that point where he can't remember who anyone is and he has to draw a diagram. <laughs> so he draws himself a diagram. And this tells us um, that Emma was the daughter of Hugo Magnus, um, who was Count of Paris, Hugo the Great, and that Richard, Duke of Normandy, was the son of William, and that's Duke William Longsword. They all have great names. Um, and William Longsword was the son of Duke Rollo. And um, this is part of the family tree that eventually leads us down to William the Conqueror, um, William I of England, who invaded and conquered in 1066, and thus the sort of very early prehistory of the ancestry of Elizabeth I and the Tudor line, um, which was an area of constant intrigue and study for Dee and many others in Elizabethan England. Right. So, from those, hopefully, um, you have seen not only some of the various interpretive uses that people can put Dee's annotations to, and there is a, a wide um, amount of scholarship that's been done on Dee's annotations and um, how they reflect his thought and his life, um, but also some of the sheer breadth of his knowledge and interests. Um, if we had to sum D up, it might be possible to say that he just wanted to know stuff and as much stuff as possible. But the canny amongst you will have spotted so far that the two most intriguing nouns from my talk's title have been conspicuous by their absence. Um, so it's time at last to turn to medicine and eventually to some <laughs> magic. Um, D was and is, in fact, often known as Dr. D. Um, and though this was due really more to his general learning and learnedness than to a specific interest or aptitude in medicine, he was, however, interested in and fairly capable at medicine. He wasn't a qualified or registered physician, and he was not a member of the RCP London. I'm obliged to say this. He received an honorary doctorate in medicine from the University of Prague in 1584 or 85, but there's no evidence he studied medicine there or anywhere else. Um, but various writers have described Dee as an excellent physician, for example, so um, there was an idea around that he was expert in medicine. And that's founded on, on some other facts. Dee's library contained dozens of books on or related to medical subjects, including many works by the classical and contemporary medical authors like Galen and Hippocrates, Avicenna, Paracelsus, who we will return to, and the anatomist Andreas Vesalius. Um, and Dee also had titles on subjects related to medicine, um, such as medicinal baths, dentistry, and botany, never mind more tangentially related subjects like alchemy. Um, we know that Dee had, for example, Della Porta's Magiae Naturalis, um, the work which includes the witch's unguent recipe um, that you can see in the exhibition, but I don't know for certain whether Dee ever tried that recipe. Um, but as with all his other interests, he did tend to look for medicine in all the things he was reading. Um, so I have three examples from the same book, from André Tevez's La Cosmographie Universelle, or The Universal Cosmography, which is a description of the whole Earth as it was known in 1575, including descriptions of geography, climate, peoples, plants, and animals. Dee made numerous notes in his copy, three of which, at least, that I found concern medicine. In common with many readers of the books produced as, as the result of co colonial expansion at the time, Dee is on the lookout for useful materials in these books, and at least these three instances, he's marking medicinal substances that are mentioned in the text. So here you can see his note, the French pox, i.e. syphilis. The text nearby um, this annotation reads, in all these aforementioned islands, which you can consider as an archipelago, and this is somewhere in Indonesia, a great disease rules, which some call the evil of Naples. Um, syphilis is always named by whoever you don't like who comes from nearby. Um, they treat themselves there with the bark of a certain large tree that they call Sank Beak. Um, and this is a sort of similar thing. Here he's written a remedy for the gout. 
Um, and that's next to a passage that says, the oil of the nut of the fruit of the guhef is a singular recipe and the proper remedy for gout, to which the poor islanders are subject, owing to the continuous torment of the sea. Um, and you can see the guhef tree and the poor islanders harvesting the nuts above. Um, this section concerns leprosy um, in the Cape Verde Islands off the west of Africa. So Dee has noted an account of curing leprosy, um, in which the text describes how people eat the flesh of turtles and then don't fail to find themselves well afterwards. And it, this cure being so evident, those people are then able to um, return back into their villages and don't need to hide away for the rest of their lives. Um, and it does also include a picture of the poor turtles being hunted, captured and butchered on land. So this uh, shows a certain theoretical interest of Dee's in medicine. Um, and that spread through lots of his reading. And this is an even less likely um, subject for medical reading. It's Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, which doesn't sound like it's going to be full of top tips. Um, but here he's noted Lapidum Medicina, or uh, the medicine of stones. And the book is describing some standing stones, monumental standing stones in Ireland, and how there's a theory that maybe they used to be used for medicinal baths. Um, so Dee has said, well, this is interesting, and underlined the piece of text that says, there is no, oh, I've lost it, there is no stone that does not have some medicinal use. So again, see, everywhere he can, he's picking out different ideas about different things. Um, further down the page as well, there's a reference to Merlin, which is quite nice. Um, he's really searching the book for genealogical information again, but, you know, medicine crops up, so he does make a note. Um, so these diaries also record details of various medical things, including his own and his family's health and the treatments he administered to them. Um, so, for example, on the 11th of March, 1577, he recorded that his fall upon his right knuckle bone with oil of hypericon in 24 hours eased above all hope. God be thanked. Um, oil of hypericon is probably hypericum perforatum, also known as St. John's wort, which is still used in various medical practices today. And this is an, an isolated incident. Um, on the 10th of June, 1579, D apparently showed to Mr. John Lewis and his son, the physician, the manner of drawing aromatical oils. So the method of distilling or producing um, aromatical or useful medical substances. Um, so I guess he was probably being shown around the laboratories. Dee's medical advice was not only sought by his family um, or his friends and neighbours, but even by Queen Elizabeth I. According to his own report, in 1578, Dee conferred with the royal physician Walter Bailey about Her Majesty's grievous pangs and pains by reason of toothache and the rheum, i.e. rheumatism. And in autumn of that year, Dee undertook a dangerous German journey, he called it a dangerous journey, across Germany, travelling as far as the city of Frankfurt and Aorda in the east of the country, where he consulted the physician Leonhard Turneiser to seek medical advice for the Queen. Um, Dee claimed that it was Francis Walsingham, the Queen's spy master, who'd sent him on the trick. According to his diaries, Dee attended patients um, closer to home as well, um, with various afflictions and symptoms. His entry for the 18th of January, 1588, gives a detailed account of his medical assistance during a miscarriage. He writes, Mistress Lydda had an abortment of a girl five or six months. She was well and merry till the night before. I helped to further the dead birth within one hour, after I had caused her to have myrrh given unto her in wine warmed, the quarter of a bowl beaten small. She was dis discharged of a secundine, that is the afterbirth, and all at once. The woman was sufficiently strong after. Um, Dee's diaries also record the details of his wife Jane's menstrual cycle, noting Jane had them when she had her period. Um, and actually, he writes that not in English or in Latin, but he writes um, it transliterated into Greek characters. Um, so the, La the English spelling, but written in the Greek letters, so an alpha for an A and so on, um, is a sort of code. Um, whether this was a particular interest in female physiology or a more prosaic interest or in whether or not Jane was pregnant, and she did, after all, bear eight children by D, um, it's not clear. Um, but he certainly did read about uh, female anatomy, um, here is a book from the New York Society Library, um, and it's a copy of Dee's copy of a Paracelsus text um, on the elements, mostly. The, Paracelsus's revised system 
of elements, mercury, sulphur, and salt, and how they can be used medicinally. Um, and the whole book is heavily annotated, including this section on the womb, which in Latin is the matrix. So it says matrices atop, across the top of the matrix of the womb. Um, and in the section on the womb, Dee is making notes on the philosophical and metaphysical nature of the womb, combining a practical interest and a metaphysical one in which the womb is seen as a microcosm of the universe. So here he's written, matrix microcosmos minimus. If man is a microcosm of the whole universe, then the womb is the microcosm of that. It's the sort of smallest, perfect reproduction of all of God's creation. Paracelsus' work, or rather the various writings attributed to him, encompasses, encompasses many different topics, and not only pure medicine, as we think of it today. He combined alchemy, mysticism, philosophy, and medicine into an esoteric and, and complex blend. And he wasn't the only medical author of the period to do this. Um, here's a commentary on parts of Pliny's Natural History, written by the German physician Walter Hermann Riff. Um, and incidentally, this is one of the books that was stolen from Dee, and you can see that at the top of the page here. This rather scribbly bit is two signatures, one over the top of the other. And originally it read Johannes D, 1562, Antwerp, I, John D, 1562, in Antwerp. Um, and then Nicholas Saunder has written his name over the top and changed the date. And he did this a lot, Nicholas Saunder. He is the source of the books at the RCP, and he does all sorts of devious things to try and blot out Dee's ownership. But elsewhere on the title page, Dee notes that Riff was medicus et mathematicus, a physician and a mathematician. However, this book, although there are sections discussing medicinal materials, and Dee did annotate those as well, is neither really medical nor certainly not mathematical. Um, and this note from Dee later on in the book gives us more of a clue about what's going on. This note reads, Medicina corpus incantatione anima sanitas, meaning medicine for the health of the body, incantations for the health of the soul. And that's because this is really a book about magic. A commentary on two chapters from Pliny's Natural History which deal with the origins of the magic art. At the very beginning of the text, Dee wrote uh, Magia Compendium, Compendium of Magic, and the book describes magic right at the start as the highest and most perfect knowledge of natural philosophy. Dee annotated it heavily on several topics um, in his really worst handwriting, um, with concerns about the nature of magic, about the spirit, the human spirit and the human soul, about the ether, about the quintessence, all sorts of different theoretical issues connected to his own mystical practices and interests. Um, but he was also interested in the book in some more sort of practical aspects, this page contains information about various sorts of divination, um, all sorts of things like uh, divining with an axe, or by looking at the clouds, or by burning plants, or by listening to your stomach, or maybe somebody else's stomach, um, by throwing patterns down on the ground, uh, by burning things, and then looking at the flame and the smoke. Um, Dee hasn't really annotated most of this, and the one bit he has annotated is up here, where it's underlined some text. And this text reads, attached to this, so attached to aromancy, looking at the clouds and the sky, is that magic which is to be done using mirrors and shining objects, in which a person or ancestor or other would appear, also castles, cities, and the like. And doesn't that sound just like Dee's own scrying practice, looking into a shining body and seeing all sorts of things? And though it's unnamed in the text, D gives it a name in the margin, berylistica, which is a peculiar and seldom used word. D uses a similar term, berylisticus, elsewhere in his Monas Hieroglyphica, for a person who has visions in a crystal. And it's also a word used by Paracelsus, describing the berylistic art as a part of the magical arts being a superstitious technique used for augury or divination. And that use of superstitious is interesting. It's a term of abuse widely bandied about at the time for any practice, religious or magical, that the writer deemed to be somewhat or definitely beyond the bounds of good sense or acceptability. So it's, it's used for all sorts of different things, depending on who's doing the writing. Dee's interest in scrying, though he was always very certain that it was legitimate, it was based in Christian religion, that it was backed by lots of theory, um, that it wasn't anything untoward, was certainly at the very edge of acceptability for general society, um, even within the wide boundaries of the kind of magical practices that people were undertaking at the time. 
and trying to communicate with other worldly be beings in order to understand the future brought Dee dangerously close to another sort of divination mentioned at the bottom of this page and in many other magical texts. That's necromancy, the practice of raising spirits back from the dead. So something Dee is really commonly associated with in his own time and later. You see a lot of imagery of him doing this sort of thing, raising bodies out of graves. Um, but he was always very adamant that that's not what he was doing. Um, but it illustrates how these things can blur one into the other and how talking about the history of magic is, is very complex and very subtle. Dee's magical practice was underpinned by spiritual and philosophical theories um, drawn from various supposedly ancient sources, including texts attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, Ptolemy, Plato, Plotinus, um, and various other Renaissance writers. Um, and magic at the time was certainly more than Dee's scrying. And Dee was certainly interested in more than just scrying. And it's pretty hard to pin down exactly what we might think of as being magic at the time. It's certainly not the magic of modern day magicians. So it's not card tricks, it's not rabbits out of hat, it's not sleight of hand. It concerns the presence and manipulation of invisible supernatural powers that could positively and negatively affect people, animals, plants, the natural world, and inanimate objects. We might, from our 21st century perspective, think of it as a way of trying to understand and control the world by means other than those which we see as having developed into modern science. And all sorts of things fall under this heading, um, superstition as we understand it today. So superstitious behaviour like touching wood or throwing salt over your shoulder or having opinions about black cats crossing your path. Charms, talismans, spells, writing magic words onto a piece of paper and eating it or tying it round yourself or sticking it up in your house various sorts of divination that we've just seen about, and also things like astrology, trying to understand the future by looking at the stars, alchemy, trying to transmute materials one into the other, and numerology or Kabbalah, trying to find patterns and meaning in numbers and in the letters of words. Many of these were embedded in everyday learned and popular medical practices. Um, physicians would take astrological factors into account when diagnosing and treating, um, and they increasingly, in the 16th century and onwards, turned to alchemically concocted remedies as part of their practice. And people, aside from the learned elite, used all sorts of charms, talismans, and spells to try and protect themselves and cure themselves from disease. All of these techniques were ways of trying to control the external world, to protect oneself from harm, and to understand what the future will bring, and potentially also to harm one's enemies. And some, at least, of these aims are very similar to the aims of medicine, to prevent illness, to diagnose and to prognose, and to cure, um, hopefully not to use it against your enemies. <coughs> However, Dee's magical practice, certainly his scrying practice, wasn't directly connected to his medical practice, or certainly no more than the average learned man offering medical advice at the time. Instead, I see them both as expressions of something else, his rapacious desire for knowledge. This drove Dee to seek out medical information and to be skilled enough to administer to patients. And it drove Dee to use a divinatory scrying practice to try and learn more about basically everything in the world. Um, we can see his interests in spirits and divination, in astrology, in alchemy, and in medicine, all as part of a wide and all-consuming interest in basically everything there is to know. So I'm going to end with what's possibly, and it's a big claim, I know, uh, my favourite page from my favourite book in the RCP library. It's the same Cicero that we saw earlier with the comments about printing, um, but this time annotated not only with words, but with pictures. Now, it's a fair question to ask what a ship's doing on this page, and I used to have quite a simplistic explanation. The text mentions a ship, which it does. Um, but I was recently at a seminar um, about annotations in Dee's books and the books of Gabriel Harvey, and Anthony Grafton, um, expert in these sorts of things, had a much more nuanced and subtle interpretation, and I'm borrowing heavily from him in what follows. Um, and this illustration is down to a verbal illustration that Cicero uses in his text. He relates the story of a shepherd in the ancient Roman author's, uh, author Accius's works. And the shepherd is looking out across the, sea, across the sea, and he spots a ship. And that's something he'd never seen before. And the ship's being tossed about by the storm. 
And at first, the shepherd doesn't understand what he sees and thinks that it's just a lifeless and inanimate object. But then he starts to hear the sailors singing, and he sees the warriors on board and starts to comprehend a little more of what he sees. And just as the shepherd, sl just as the shepherd slowly realises what he's seeing, these marginalia reveal how he's taking apart and comprehending the text and through it the world. We, as later viewers, by examining his notes, can start to understand him and the world he inhabited. And, slowly, we too start to look more deeply and see the sailors that Dee drew. If I may borrow a phrase from the late, great Douglas Adams, John Dee, like Adams' detective character Dirk Gently, was concerned with the fundamental interconnectedness of all things. Though it's jarring to modern categorizations of knowledge, to Dee, nothing was more obvious than that studying and practicing astrology, medicine, mathematics, and magic might jointly contribute to an, an enhanced understanding and a real physical improvement in the material world. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk backslash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.